Good morning, everybody. Let me welcome you to this uh, presentation of the African Doctor Fellows, uh, Africa Programs Doctor Fellows. Uh, welcoming Ted Powers this morning. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. We might have a few more coming in, but in uh, in mid-August in Washington D.C., this is probably about as good a group as you can get out for uh, for this kind of presentation. Um, uh, this actually, I won't do the standard in introduction to the Woodrow Wilson Center, I think you probably all know it, but in terms of uh, President Wilson's idea of bringing uh, uh, the worlds of policy and the worlds of, uh, of academia together, uh, this is the perfect example of it. These kind of fellowships and, and the work that Ted and his colleagues are doing here at the Wilson Center. Um, so we're very, very honored to be able uh, to have him here today. I'm sitting in, as I often do, for my colleague Howard Wolpe, who is actually in the hospital as we speak. He's had a, a small back procedure uh, that seems to have gone very successfully, and we're wishing him a quick recovery, which seems to be happening. I spoke to him just a few moments ago. Uh, but he couldn't be here for this, and so I'm in his stead. Um, the, um, uh, the, the presenter today, Ted Powers, um, let me first of all introduce him. Uh, he is a Ph.D. candidate in anthropology at the Graduate Center at CUNY. Uh, City University of New York. Uh, he has his a master's degree in anthropology from Hunter College and also a master's of philosophy from CUNY as well, the Graduate Center at CUNY. His BA is in political science from, from Bates College and he will be a graduate fellow at the Center for Peace and Culture Politics at CUNY Graduate Center for the 2008-2009 academic year. Uh, the theme for the upcoming year is Place and Politics under the new direction for the new director of the center, distinguished professor David Harvey. Uh, the project that he is working on, which I won't spend much time on describing because he's going to spend a lot of time on it, is uh, really an analysis of the institutional political forces that have shaped uh, uh, the governmental response to the HIV AIDS epidemic in South Africa over the last few years. And he's looking at it, uh, we all know that of course South Africa has the highest rate of infection in the world and, and uh, we're all at least peripherally aware of, uh, of some of the governmental uh, 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 breakdowns in addressing HIV AIDS uh, there in South Africa at the presidential level and on down, but Ted is really looking at the local level and the lack of coordination there. And his research has been in a township in, uh, in the Cape Flats called Kayalicha, in, in a sm small community there uh, called Harare, uh, where we have uh, mostly Zimbabwean uh, 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 refugees settled. Um, and uh, the, the reason, uh, the, the real reason behind this uh, at least in uh, his explanation to me, I think, is is for the international community and the donor community in particular to be aware of the kind of breakdown in delivery of services and uh, uh, and the whole xenophobic and refugee resettlement problems that are going on down there in terms of the application and implementation of uh, assistance into uh, community-based organizations in South Africa. Um, I will turn it over to Ted in a minute, but I'm very, very pleased personally to have the chance to moderate this particular uh, uh, presentation because of my own history in South Africa, which most of you probably aren't aware of. I was there as an embassy officer in 1976 to 1980, a long, long time ago. But the roots of this problem was, began then and has gone right through. I've uh, been in and out of South Africa over the years uh, many, many times, war talking with the government, working with the government, uh, uh, going out to the communities. Recently I was there, just got back about three days ago, and uh, the, uh, the uh, problems that Ted is talking about uh, are, are, are very visual. I had a chance for the first time in about six years to drive out in the countryside a lot and drive down through the Cape Flats, uh, Mitchell's Plain, Kayalicha, Philippi Farms, uh, uh, Crossroads, and et cetera, uh, Zico Flay, and, and, and see the expansion of the informal settlements there, the uh, squatter camps, and et cetera, that are just massive. But you also see it up in the Western Cape in the wine growing areas and, and all over the place. Uh, if you've been in and out of Johannesburg, in and out of Cape Town, as I do very frequently, you see it. In the cities as well, uh, but I was really struck by by the the massive uh, growth in the informal communities uh, throughout the countryside. Um, so, with that short introduction, uh, let me turn it over to Ted. Thanks very much, Steve. Um, good morning, and thank you all very much for coming. I know it's the middle of August in D.C., and many of our friends have already made it over to the beach or on vacation, and some of us are already mentally over there with them. Um, but I, I want to kind of keep this focus on perhaps being out of DC for my presentation today and try to, to describe the local processes in South Africa 
to take you to the experiences in the townships and the challenges they're facing with HIV and AIDS. Um, before I get started, though, I'd first like to thank a few of the folks here at the Wilson Center who've been so supportive during my time here. Uh, first, the Africa program, Gregor, Natalie, Mamkade, Justine, Molly. You guys have been great. Thanks very much for all your support. Uh, my colleagues, uh, Julie Giat, Michael Wadamariam, who commented on earlier versions of this presentation. You guys have been great. Thanks very much. To my intern, Beth Guthrie, uh, who helped me comb through a year of data to pull this together. That was invaluable. Thanks for your help. Um, to Skip Burkle for his guidance and friendship. And I just want to really underline the fact that the Wilson Center is an excellent uh, resource and it's been very productive for my own research to spend time here. <clears throat> I've recently returned from 12 months of field work in South Africa. And for the majority of my time, I was in the Cape Town metropolitan area. Um, I did spend some time in Johannesburg and Durban. However, in Cape Town itself, there are eight health subdistricts under the Singer Met Metropolitan Health District. For each of these health subdistricts, there's a coordinating mechanism for both the governmental and civil society community-based response called an MSAT, or a multi-sectoral action team. And if you, there's a handout that when you walked in with a list of kind of key terms, and this is described on there. Now, I had the opportunity to speak with members and leaders for four of the eight Kemptown MSATs. Um, about the challenges they're having in coordination, but their work in the communities. Um, and I'd just like to start with an excerpt from one of my interviews with one of these MSAT leaders. It seems that politics here is somehow distant from getting involved with HIV AIDS issues, and that is the challenge that you're sitting with. They receive funding, and we approach them to say that we don't receive adequate funding. And it's just like there's really a deafness. They're supposed to be part of our meetings, and, and that is one of the challenges that we sit with. Some structures are supposed to be part of the MSAT strategy. They don't attend meetings at the sub-district level. This is happening all over. And what I want to draw your attention to out of this quote is, is the first part, that politics is somehow distant from HIV AIDS at the local level. And, and that's the, the dynamic that I'm, I'm trying to describe today. And in order to do that, I'm going to have to cover just a touch of the background to this, and I'm going to try to move through it as quickly as I can, um, some of the key organizations, and then move to a description about the actual local dynamics through the institutions. In this presentation, I will argue that there's an inconsistent coordination of HIV AIDS between stakeholder departments, while feedback from communities is systematically constrained. Furthermore, representatives in the community have been, representative structures in the community have been politicized driving HIV AIDS off of the local government agenda. The device of national politics of HIV AIDS is now also affecting the coordination of community-based projects in Kailicha. Finally, preliminary findings in one town within Kailicha indicate that there's a correlation between income-generating development projects and ANST constituency areas. These process processes are significant because it is the level of local government which is key for implementation and solely responsible for policy implementation in the decentralized South African political system. Although South Africa has maintained world-class AIDS policy since 1992, the implementation of these policies has been inconsistent. This project focuses on the Western Cape province in order to understand the institutional and political impediments to policy implementation for HIV and AIDS. At the local level, the city of Cape Town and the district of Kailicha were selected to understand the interplay between provincial, national, and local level policy processes. The recent reauthorization of the President's Emergency Plan for HIV AIDS Relief, PEPFAR, continue, continues to move U.S. policy on HIV and AIDS in a positive direction. However, now is not the, sign, the time to sit back and marvel at this accomplishment, but to continue to work to refine this worthwhile initiative. PEPFAR is an outcomes-based program that is dedicated to building local capacity in recipient countries. While South Africa is in the midst of its second decade of democracy, we sh this mandate should be revisited to support the development of its local institutions deepen democratic participation, and foster meaningful policy input from community members. While my research portrays a challenging picture of local political processes in Kailicha, I want to emphasize that my experiences in, in South Africa are ones that left me deeply impressed by the South Africans contributing to the process of creating a stable, democratic society that tackles the historical legacies of racism and inequality inherited from apartheid. The question that we must now answer is how do we put our weight behind those who continue to push this process forward? And this is just a, 
kind of a quick outline of, of where my research is going to be covering, the presentation is going to be covering today. Um, and, and the first is just a quick contextualization of how South Africa fits in the global HIV AIDS epidemic. Uh, the second is a brief overview of the history of how informal settlements came to exist in South Africa and what's driving the, their growth today. Uh, the third is a really brief overview of the current public health crisis in South Africa and how this is fit within a larger challenge in service delivery in the post-apartheid era. And then the last part of the presentation will be an outline of the key actors involved in HIV AIDS politics and how this is operating in terms of a dynamic in Kailicha. Um, and finally, I'll just offer some, uh, some of the issues that I think have implications for the donor community and policy here in DC. Now this is a, the typical UNAID slide that probably everyone shows at their presentation. Um, but I think for someone who's doing a project in Southern Africa, um, it's important to show that this is really is the epicenter of the global epidemic. Um, while there are 33.2 million infections globally, 22.5 million of these are in Sub-Saharan Africa. And 68%, that's 68% of the, the global total. Now 35% of all infections in Sub-Saharan Africa exist in Southern Africa with 32% of all new infections occurring in this region as well. Now for South Africa specifically, there are five and a half million infections. That's 18.8% of the adult population. However, I, I want to kind of critically engage with that number because it's not an even distribution between the quote unquote racial categories of the apartheid era. Um, this is predominantly affecting black South Africans. Um, black South Africans were seven times more likely than colored South Africans to be infected. 8.3 times more likely to be infected than Indian South Africans, and 22.1 times more likely to be infected with HIV AIDS than white South Africans. And if you look at this number that only 21% of those who are needing antiretroviral therapy are receiving it, the reason why I think that's important is that this is primarily affecting poor black South Africans in the country. Now this is just quickly a map of the country, and I just want to offer this to contextualize where my research is actually occurring. If you, if you look right here, this is the Western Cape. Um, sorry, get the microphone and the laser at the same time, might be a stretch. Um, and this is, of course, Cape Town right here. Um, now, I, I would manage to conduct interviews in five of the six health districts um, with, with some of the key representatives in the Western Cape. I also was doing some research with the National AIDS Council in Pretoria and within Johannesburg. Um, I'm not covering the national or provincial aspects of my research today, just the very local political dynamics. Um, but a reason why I think this is important is this is the 2006 HIV antenatal survey that was done. And if you look, this right here is Cape Town at 17.0%, and this is the 2005 statistics. Um, but if you look at KwaZulu-Natal, you can see that some of these health districts are over 40% in the antenatal surveys. Um, and again, KwaZulu-Natal is the, really the epicenter of the epidemic in South Africa, up in Hauteng, where Johannesburg, is located, uh, you see that there's prevalence rates of over 30%. So really, Western Cape is in some ways a success story because of the institutional framework it's been able to implement in the kind of, at a very early stage. This was the first to roll out uh, the prevention of mother-to-child transmission, PMTCT, the first to roll out dual therapy. So for better or worse, I chose one of the better equipped provinces and the better institutionalized provinces in the country to do this research. Um, as this has already existed, and it makes it a better case for understanding the institutional dynamics. Now, this, this next slide is a, a breakdown of HIV prevalence in Cape Town, and this is actually according to the old town system and not according to the, the present um, health sub-district system. But what I really want to draw your attention to is the, the comparison between the central Cape Town district, the, the CBD, around 11%, and then to Kailicha around 33% for the last three years. They have data in Google, Google Nyanga, which is around 29%. And what I, this is a huge disparity within 17% for the metropolitan district. And what I want to emphasize is that these are the areas that are housing the majority of informal settlements in the Cape Metro district. Now this actually correlates quite clearly to national level statistics, and this is data that was pulled together by Liz Thomas, um, who does a lot of work on local governance and <coughs> HIV AIDS. Um, and she took HSRC data um, from 2002, 
and was able to indicate that at that time, 80% of the country's inhabitants lived in formal settlements and their prevalence rate was around 12%. But for the 20% of the country that lived in informal settlements, the prevalence rate was closer to 21%. So this is a key jumping off point uh, for my research, which is that we need to interrogate why informal settlements have a higher prevalence rate and what the effects of this are. How are we going to maintain informal settlements in, in, in terms of a, a healthy uh, pattern of settlement. How can we support that? The growth of informal settlements is not a unique pattern for South Africa. Throughout the developing world, cities such as Lima, Lagos, Mexico City, and Kinshasa are growing, and so are the populations that live at their outskirts in peri-urban informal settlements. In his work, Planet of Slums, Mike Davis defines peri-urban informal settlements or slums as key geopolitical spaces as they will be the primary source of the world's population growth in the 21st century. However, the process through which informal settlements came to exist in South Africa predates the current urbanization process described by Davis. In colonial Cape Town, freed slaves set up shacks outside of the metropolitan district in 1834 following emancipation. In the late 19th century, the South African mining industry worked with the state to construct a migrant labor system with labor sourced from the internal black South African population from surrounding countries such as Lesotho, Swaziland, and Mozambique. These workers were either housed in labor compounds or in segregated urban areas that were overcrowded due to inadequate housing, which led to informal settlement and backyard shacks. Upon coming to power in 1948, the National Party went about building its apartheid project by expanding so-called influx control policies to keep black African laborers out of cities. During this period, the mass removal of black inner city inhabitants of Sophia Town, which is in Johannesburg, District 6 in Cape Town. Uh, this was accompanied by the construction of the major townships, um, such as Soweto in Johannesburg, Nyanga and Guguletu in, in Cape Town, and Mlazi in Kwamushu in Durban. This was in the 1950s and 60s. The township of Karlicha, where my research took place, was formally created in March 1983 when it was announced that black people could legally reside in metropolitan Cape Town. However, the plots upon which people were allowed to build were only 35% of the size that was originally outlined for the, uh, the townships in the 1950s. Using that level of spatial organization, the initial population for Carlicia was estimated to be housed around 250,000 people. Today, population estimates range from 600,000 to 1 million. So I think that gives a, those numbers give a clear idea about the level of densification uh, that's occurring right now and the overcrowding in this area. The contemporary urbanization process is being driven by increased poverty in rural areas and greater economic opportunity in urban areas. And this process is manifesting itself in the context of unemployment rates of 25.5 for the formal definition. The expanded definition continues to hover on 40%. While in informal settlements, surveys have had ranges of between 57 and 72% unemployment. So there's a clear correlation between unemployment and residency and informal settlements. However, an economic rationale can also be applied uh, to the correlation between HIV and AIDS in informal settlements. Um, outside of, of rather straightforward correlations between um, the inability to work on a regular basis and being infected with HIV or having full-blown AIDS, um, having access to transport, additional medication, and food places stressors on households um, that can push households that are just on the brink of making ends meet into informal settlements. Um, however, a, a shift has really occurred in, in, the, in the patterns that we saw in South Africa in terms of labor migration and movement. Um, for the apartheid period, and, and really the dominant uh, dynamic throughout South African history, was that African men would work on mines, coming from their quote-unquote homelands or Matustans and going to the mines in the northern part of the country, or going to urban areas and working as a laborer. Um, <coughs> now, that, that pattern led to really the correlation between the syphilis outbreak in the country in the 1950s as a public health issue, but due to the movement of men between the mines and the homelands. Now this pattern has begun to change in the post-apartheid period um, as people are moving to urban areas more rapidly, but this process has now shifted to internal movement within the townships and between Cape Town and the townships itself. Now the reason why this is important is that recent research indicates that movement is, can be a predictor of HIV, HIV status. If you're, if you're moving more than four times, it's raising the possibility that you're gonna have HIV. Um, and even more disturbing is, for, at least from my perspective, is that 
many, much of this movement now is not men any longer, it's women, utilizing survival strategies for raising children, leaving children in rural areas with family, and having to then live in peri-urban informal settlements, and shuttle back and forth between the, the informal settlement and their homes, helping to raise their children from a young age. Now, given the unemployment rates that I've described earlier, um, it's clear that very few of those who live in informal settlements are able to access private medical care, which is excellent in South Africa. So there's a, a dependence upon the public health system by the majority of those who are poor and live with HIV. Um, and the, the big issue is that there is an ongoing public health crisis, which altogether should not be incredibly surprising given the HIV prevalence rates and the opportunis opportunistic infections that arise when one is infected with HIV. Um, but the, the, another issue that's involved with this is the, is the continuing brain drain um, in terms of nurses and doctors from the South African public health sector to England, particularly, but also Europe and the United States. Um, that's really debilitating the fight against HIV and AIDS in Southern Africa. Uh, you can really see the impact of these services starting at 4 a.m. and 5 a.m. outside of community clinics in nearly every township in South Africa, but I saw this specifically in Kailicha. Um, and this is the description of the impact of these processes by one local activist in Kailicha. They wait months to be put on treatment. And I've been asked what is going on. And I've been told that we don't have enough staff members or enough doctors or enough nurses to increase the number of patients to be on treatment. It compromises everything. It paralyzes almost everything. You can go out and mobilize people to, on testing. When people go to the clinic, they don't get tested. They take hours to be tested, just to be tested for HIV. People who are sick, there is a problem. The crisis in the public health sector is undermining the collective response to HIV AIDS epidemic as the vast majority of South Africans must depend on the public health sector for their care. The crisis is also being driven by inadequate funding allocations as well as a lack of institutional capacity. However, public health is not the only service that is experiencing difficulty in the post-apartheid era. The ANC has made progress in the extension of services to historically underserved areas. However, in 2002, a critical review of service delivery in South Africa found that out of the 7 people who, million people who had received access to water since 1994, 1.26 million people were unable to pay their bills, or 18%. Another 1.2 of the 7 million were forced to choose between purchasing water and other vital items for, the, for their households um, in, in the face of water. In sum, nearly 2.5 million of the 7 million who had received access to water exper experienced difficulty meeting the cost of this service. The privatization of water in particular has led to social mobilization in the peripheries of the major cities of Johannesburg, Cape Town, and Durban in response to the outbreaks of cholera and dysentery that were the public health consequences of water cutoffs. To contextualize why poor and working class South Africans were str have struggled with priest paid service delivery, take into consideration these figures from Kailicha. An independent survey carried out in 2003 indicated that half of Kailicha's residents live on less than 167 rand per month, or that's about $23 and change. And a third of residents live on less than 39 rand a month, which is a little bit less than 550. Approximately 80% of Kailicha's residents live in informal settlements. In two areas of Kailicha, sites B and C, where I, I did a fair amount of research, there are an average of 105 people per toilet. I think for those of us who have more than one toilet in our apartments, that can be a, it's a, really, a, a statistic that really hits home. In Cape Town, there's an estimated housing backlog of 265,000 homes, and this number continues to grow by 16,000 homes annually. This is contributing to the growing population of Cape Town living in informal settlements, which is currently estimated to be one-third of the city's population. This, the social impact of the privatization of services and cost recovery in this field has been well documented. However, my focus is on how we're going to understand the impact of this process on local democratic processes. Uh, Patrick Heller argues that this shift toward, toward cost recovery has involved increased reliance on technical criteria to make policy decisions. This focus on managerial models and financial efficiency has excluded input from communities on the policies that determine service delivery in their areas. A key jumping off point for my research is Heller's insight that the closure of the local policy process has pushed the South African civics movement into local representative structures. My research asks what effect, if any, the shift described by Heller has had on the implementation of HIV AIDS policies. It has a shift towards highly technical policies 
and the loss of local political autonomy pushed the civics to quote-unquote capture local representative structures in order to maintain influence on and control over their communities? And if so, what are the implications of this process for HIV AIDS policy in South Africa and the donor community? And, and just to, to contextualize the argument thus far, really the issue with, with, with the high burden of disease, particularly around HIV and AIDS in South Africa, is that people are increasingly relying on public services. All right? However, at the same time that they're relying on public services, these services have been, for the large part, privatized. The, the, the use of user fees at public hospitals is a, is a trend that's on the rise, um, which is a worrying trend. Um, and again, this is in the context of the unemployment and uh, financial constraints that I've described earlier. However, outside of these broad economic criteria, all right, the political effect of moving the management of services outside the realm of local government has been that local communities aren't able to access and democratize these service delivery models to match their community's needs. All right, so the manager or the local ANC or ward counselor essentially plays a service of overseeing the distribution of these services that are then privatized. Community members then have to kind of try to feed back into this process but are not able to because it's usually technical input that is valued from external um, advisors, consultants that drives the process. Um, now, Heller's point is that because these traditionally powerful organizations in the community, the community organization structures, uh, the civics, street committees, etc., are then moving to occupy local level committees um, as a way to maintain power and influence locally. My question is, is how is this affecting implementation? So in order to contextualize the transformation of local politics in the post-apartheid period and the significance of this for HIV AIDS policy, I will first describe the municipal structures coordinating the HIV AIDS response for the city of Cape Town and Kailicha. The key actors in the politics of HIV AIDS and Kailicha are the Treatment Action Campaign and the South African National Civic Organization, or SENCO, which I'll refer to it from now on. Um, their different roles in politics will be analyzed next. After this brief description, I will offer an analysis of how the divisive national politics of HIV AIDS is affecting the coordination and implementation of HIV AIDS policies in Kailicha. All right, now I'm going to try to move through this quickly because I know how scintillating these, these organograms are. Um, so just to quickly review, can everyone in the back see this? I apologize, it's a little bit blurry. Um, this level of this diagram is the provincial level. Um, and again, we're not, I'm not going to be going over this today, but there's a provincial AIDS council um, in the Western Cape um, that's chaired by the kind of member of provincial cabinet who focuses on health, the, the health MEC. For city health, the head of city health chairs the city coordinating committee, um, which again is the metropolitan structure for coordinating both government, community-based, and civil society initiatives for HIV and AIDS. So I think the, the, key, the key issue to keep in mind is that South Africa's HIV AIDS policies are all multi-sectoral, and they're a joint policy between government and civil society. All right, so these coordinating committees are supposed to bring together a disparate group of actors um, around implementation. Oh, uh-oh. Oh, uh phew, -oh. Oh, all right. All right, I won't touch that button again, I promise. All right, now the multi-sectoral action team or MSETs that I began this talk by discussing are here at this level, that are the sub-district level. And this is really from here on out where I'll be focusing, is down at the local level. Now, um, the Asanla Institute um, has commissioned and analyzed the city level body, um, so it would have been redundant to have done that research all over again. Um, however, some of the research findings that I think are relevant for the discussion today are that there's, at this level of the city coordinating committee, um, there's not consistent representation from the key sectors. Those who do come from the key government sectors are not decision makers. So no decisions can be essentially made in that body from, say, social development, education, or health. Um, there's poor attendance. Uh, there's limited representation from the business community. And there's a lack of really two-way dialogue, which uh, in layman's terms means that government officials refuse to carry out in-depth conversation with community members. Um, so this city-level body is, is, does face challenges, and, and interviews that I carried out with members or those who attended these meetings confirmed all of these findings by the Asanla Institute. However, for my own research, I wanted to examine more closely how local government structures operated below the level of city-wide bodies. 
I chose the subject district of Kailicha and focused on the relationship between its MSAT, or this multi-sectoral action team, the coordinating mechanism, and the community. Uh, so just to review, they coordinate the work of community-based organizations and HIV and AIDS in each of the eight, eight health subdistricts. Uh, these MSATs are currently funded by the Global Fund, and they receive 15,000 rand per annum. Um, that's just over $2,000 per year. And if you do the quick math on that, for a, a subdistrict of 400,000 people, that's less than half a U.S. cent per capita. So these MSATs are also experiencing similar problems to the City Coordinating Committee. There's a lack of buy-in from key sector departments, and again, they're supposed to be attended and have buy-in from government officials that are working in their areas at the level of sub-district so as to coordinate and refine the response per sub-district below the metropolitan level. Uh, there have been promises to capacitate the MSATs. These promises have not been fulfilled. Uh, they continue to operate primarily as a mechanism for distributing and funding and monitoring and evaluating the response of community-based organizations. There is consensus amongst all those involved that if these structures are going to work, they need to be capacitated, both financially and in terms of human resources. However, the political issues faced by those leading these MSATs extends well beyond that of the challenges with funding and capacity. Speaking with members of the Kailicha MSAT, they described a lack of cooperation from the Kailicha Health Forum. These subject forums are intended to serve as a voice for the communities. However, members of the Kailicha MSAT saw this health forum as an obstacle to the, the successful implementation of new initiatives. The inability of these two institutions to work together means that the city and the community cannot effectively coordinate HIV-AIDS policy. Therefore, even if HIV-AIDS is effectively mainstreamed into Cape Town's integrated development plans or any other municipal project, that at this level between the city coordinating bodies or the subject coordinating bodies in the community, there's a disjuncture. So th the question that remains in this formulation is why the community structure, the Kailicha Health Forum, is not working with the formal coordinating structure, the MSAT. And I know that there's a danger in utilizing a, a specific case study to generalize about an entire country, and, and, I, and I recognize that that's an issue. However, what I'd like to emphasize is that the dynamics that, that I saw on the ground that were operating in Kailicha, and particularly within Harare, the, the town that I was able to do um, some more specific work on these issues, that the dynamics are being driven by national level organizations. All right? and, and I think that's the important thing to keep in mind here, is that it's not while well, there are community-to-community -community differentiations in terms of how these politics are manifesting themselves, there's national-level organizations that are driving it. And the first of these two organizations, and I'm just going to quickly touch on the, the two most important players. Um, and again, this is the affirmation South African National Civic Organization. Now, SENCO was formed in 1992, but it really is the formalization of the, the key structure for the anti-apartheid movement, which was the street committees um, that kind of developed into civic structures in the major townships in South Africa. Um, now, there's currently 6.3 million members in 43 branches in South Africa. Um, now, these organizations ran into financial difficulty, this organization ran into financial difficulty in 96, um, after the period negotiated transition to democracy. Um, now, after this period, it's developed a close working relationship with the ANC um, and a relationship that's grown stronger as new social movements such as the Soweto Electricity Crisis Committee and the Anti-Privatization Forum have challenged the service delivery models in the townships. So Senko has been able to leverage the emergence of new actors and new political organizations in the townships to act as an intermediary between the ANC and the community. All right? And its, its occupation of this structure is quite relevant for that. Um, the, the second key organization is the Treatment Action Campaign, um, which was founded in 98 to pressure the South African government and international community to provide treatment to all South Africans living with HIV. In its early campaigns, TAC focused on access to antiretroviral therapy and lowering the prices of pharmaceuticals uh, globally, but specifically for South Africa. Um, the organization is a key driver of the, restru the restructured South African National AIDS Council and has really played a key role in driving the new national AIDS policy, the National Strategic Plan for HIV, AIDS, and STIs, which aims to triple those receiving therapy or AIDS treatment and to cut the infection rate in half by 2011, which I think is, is, a, is a plan that we all need to get behind as an international community. 
However, the TIC has also created, taken a highly critical stance of the HAVA, HAVA's dissident stance of President Thabo Mbeki and his Minister of Health, Matthew Shabalala Misameng. While Mbeki has never openly stated that HIV-AIDS does not cause AIDS, he created an expert advisory panel on HIV-AIDS in 2000 that included both traditional scientists and HIV-AIDS dissident scientists who questioned the link between HIV and AIDS. The dissident approach led to the Minister of Health showing up at the 2006 International AIDS Conference with garlic, beetroot, African potato, and lemon, and offering this up as an alternative therapy for those suffering from AIDS. Uh, the treatment action campaign along with the AIDS Law Project and other organizations have critiqued this position for challenging the, le the legitimacy of modern science and the potentially damaging influence it may have on people living with HIV AIDS making choices about treatment options. Based upon interviews that I did with public health doctors in Kailicha, this damage has been substantial. However, the primary issue for this presentation is the political dynamic that has resulted from the controversies over HIV and AIDS and how these are manifesting in the level of local politics. The treatment action campaign has been labeled by members of the ANC as a tool of global pharmaceutical companies, while members of the treatment action campaign have called on members of the ANC leadership to be tried for genocide. The fact that Sanko's political survival is intertwined with that of the ANC has meant that attacks on the ANC by the treatment action campaign have caused a rift between the two key actors for community organization for HIV AIDS and Kailicha. There, there is therefore a split in civil society that is creating a huge challenge for effective coordination and implementation of HIV AIDS policies in Kailicha and throughout South Africa. This is a challenge for the donor community as this indicates a dual split in the coordinated effort to combat HIV and AIDS at the local level in one township. Between the MSAT, the coordinating mechanism in the community, and between key civil society groups. In this slide, the difficulty thus far in implementing HIV AIDS policies should not come as a huge surprise, especially given the fact that much of the work done around HIV AIDS is outsourced by the state to civil society organizations. However, a question that troubled me for some time after reaching these conclusions discussed above is if community structures are not actively coordinating HIV and AIDS initiatives in the epicenter of the global epidemic, what exactly are they doing? Due to a close relationship with a community resident from the town of Harare in Kailicha, I chose to conduct research in Ward 98, on, which is Harare in Elita Park, on how the policies of HIV were affecting the role of local government institutions in the struggle against HIV and AIDS. During a conversation with this key research, key research participant, we shifted from the topic of policing and justice in Harare to the role of the community in improving the situation. When I asked what those in local government were doing about the situation in this person's area, the community resident replied that they were doing nothing. Now, I did not believe this, and I pushed the conversation further on a number of occasions. Eventually, this person agreed to speak with me openly about these issues. The responses of the community member led me to do, conduct a mapping exercise on what kinds of projects were being developed in the community and where they were located. The governing party and its local representatives were in fact developing strategies to combat crime and create income generating opportunities for the community. And I think the idea that they would be doing nothing is, is absurd. However, the key idea was where these projects were being developed and for which part of the community. Just as there is a community health forum to guide the coordinated response to health in Kailicha, there's a Kailicha wide and ward based development forums that focus on community development within their respective areas. Now again, these are this, these community structures that, that Heller was discussing earlier, right? That as local government space for policy decisions is closed due to privatization, that the civics movements are moving into these local community structures and occupying them. Um, the Harare Development Forum is primarily occupied by Senko members and directed by the ANC affiliated ward councillor. So the first effect of Senko's capture of local structures that is important to note is that the organization serves as the primary community feedback mechanism from the community to the local political leadership. Now, on this point, Sanko's occupation of local structures is merely an extension of the realities as they exist on the ground. For example, if there's a dispute between two neighbors, they may go to the police and complain about their neighbor. Now, the mechanism that would be used oftentimes to facilitate uh, a resolution to the situation would be a street committee. Now, street committees are a, a key mode of social organization in the townships. And in this case, Sanko is, is the key player in Harare in terms of, of, of governing the street committees. All right. Now, these street committees were, of course, vital in the anti-apartheid struggle. Um, 
However, the consequences of this, of this dynamic is that community members whose input is not accepted by members of SANCO are essentially excluded from local representative structures. I ran into this issue with one community activist who continually was trying to put issues of HIV and AIDS, crime prevention, and social development on the local agenda on any number of meetings and was unable to do so. Eventually, this activist gave up on trying to use these local level political mechanisms for trying to change the politics and policies of his community. So, in this way, and Sunco is actually stifling democratic input at the most local level in South Africa, that of, that of ward level and that of street committee. The second effect of Sanko's whole and local structures, particularly the, particularly the Hari Development Forum, is that the organization plays a key role in gu guiding community development. This excerpt from an interview with a community activist will illustrate the point. And, and this is just an excerpt from an interview, and I kept my questions in there so you could see more objectively that the conversation in TP is me, Ted Powers, and this is the activist with a coded name. So what effect does Sanko have on the community? I mean, do they have a big influence on what people think and the way that they act? They have a big influence on the people in the community. How do they have an influence? They are the one that is bringing development. If there's anything that is going to be built or take place or be built in the area, it should start through their meetings. So it's through Sanko. Yeah. They should agree as Sanko members before they go. There's an Exco meeting, which is executive committee. And they should agree at the Exco meeting before they call a general meeting for the whole area to understand what is going on to tell the community. But it's within Sanko's structures that they decide that. Yeah. They don't decide that with everyone in the community. They will decide that. You can't just go there and be a speaker. You have to consult with Usanko. And if Usanko is happy with what you're going to do, they are going to say, it's fine, build it or do it. And if they're not happy, they will point you to that direction and point you to that direction and point you to that direction and you end up losing. So I think the important thing to, to, to characterize here is that Sanko is therefore playing a key role in two local community structures. One is for the HIV AIDS coordinating effort and one is to, for social development. Um, and, and there's two very different processes that are at play. In one, it's using that structure to essentially try and create more space for its own politics and the politics of the community to have a say in terms of HIV and AIDS. And in this other case, um, it's in some ways guiding the, the, the social development process in Harare. So the second question that I was faced with was, okay, if they're guiding this process, what's the objective picture of how this process is being guided? How had a Harare development form that's being guided by Sanko and an ANC ward councillor led the development process? So the first part of the mapping exercise was, was to determine the actual geographic area that I was going to analyze. And as it turned out, this was primarily due to those who I was doing the exercise with. They were only comfortable doing the exercise with half of the political ward or within Harare itself, within the town of Harare itself, and not in Lita Park, um, which is the other half of Ward 98, the political ward. All right, so this is the, the planning map for Harare. Um, now, and it's what I've tried to draw out in this map, and again, I'm, I'm not a professional artist, so just brace yourselves, it's not going to be beautiful, um, is that the green area is the ANC political constituency area, the orange area is the political constituency area of the independent democrats and sometimes ANC, non-affiliated, independent. In this middle, I'll use this pointer, this middle political area is contested. Okay, so this is a, an area that is, that is kind of a swing area. Now, Continuing with this conversation with the community activists and pulling a bit more out of that interview that I carried out, um, he said all the project that came for Harare is only for that area. There's a score, there's a sports center, there's a community hospital in that area. And when he says that area, this individual is referring to the ANC constituency area. And they are from outside of that area in the town of Harare. Now, if you, if you look at this map, and for those in the back, I hope that you can, you're able to see it, um, we, I've kept the political constituency lines on the map itself and I focused on projects that were taking place in the post-apartheid period. Now this S, and again I'm not a professional artist, um, is a school that was built in the post-apartheid period. There's a high school here that was built prior to that. The yellow dots represent here, here, all over the map. They represent churches and creches which are essentially daycare centers for young children. The orange dots represent income-generating de income de social development projects. 
this blue square is a police station, and this orange uh, or reddish orange cross is a hospital, so it's a community clinic. All right, so you know, after conducting this exercise with community members, I, I realized that, look, there's, a, there's a, a rough correlation between income generating development projects and the ANC political constituency area. However, th this is uh, Linguletu West Shopping Center, all right, which also has a rape clinic there. It also has a community center. Uh, however, it's difficult to, to draw enough dots in a small amount of space to, to adequately represent it. But this is a shopping center that's been developed, all right, and it has a, some community facilities in it as well. Now, the, the question that I was faced with is, okay, what is the, the, what's the other data that I can get my hands on to contextualize, actually, the importance of this initiative, the, the development of this shopping center with community services in one political constituency area? And this data is on the current distribution of businesses within Harare. And again, this is the boundary for Harare here. And then this up here is Lita Park, and this is the Kailicha um, Business Center. Um, and if you just look at this area, and again, the dots are difficult to see, ap apologies, um, there is actually a relatively even distribution. Um, so I, I brought this, this data um, back to those who did the mapping exercise with, and I said, look, I, I think that while there's a few projects that were built in this other area, if you look at the distribution of businesses and income generation, there's a relatively balanced picture. And again, this, this uh, Data was constructed by the VPUU, which is Violence Prevention Through Urban Upgrading um, in Kailicha, which is a, a developmental project that is, has drafted um, a, a draft urban design. And I'll, this, I'm going to put this, superimpose this on the map in the next slide. But this right here is the break between Harare and Lita Park. And this is going up to the area where you saw all of the, the business cluster, the Kailicha Business Center. Now, the idea behind this this uh, draft urban design is essentially to create a development corridor in Kailicha and connecting Lita Park and Harare. Now Lita Park is historically a more developed community. Um, most of the, much of the homes were built with a subsidy system rather than just built by the state, which means they're of higher quality. There's fewer backyard shacks. It's a less dense neighborhood. Um, it's generally a more working middle class part of Kailicha. And this differentiation is beginning to occur within townships in the post-apartheid period. Um, now, what they're hoping to do with this development corridor, and this process is starting very slowly, is build craft markets, sporting ground schools, small enterprise centers, and housing. And this is what it looks like superimposed on the, on the political constituency map. And if this is this area in purple, all right, that's the development corridor. And again, I, as I mentioned, it, it spreads up just in this area right here, up into Lita Park. So again, this is Lingiletu West Shopping Center, I mentioned before the resources that's having there. This is that high school, they're going to build a playground there. And part of the plan is to build two new schools, one here and one here. So I think that the correlation is relatively clear um, in terms of political constituency areas and where these social development projects are, are occurring. Um, so in, in some ways it does contextualize that this individual who did interviews with actually took part in the VPUU um, surveys and in drafting this strategy as part of a consultative strategy, which means that the VPU did consult the community. They did go to the community. But the strategy was drafted through the community development forums and through consultation with them. All right? So when this person says they're not doing anything in my area, well, something could be happening in Harare. But the question is, where is it happening and for whom? Now, just a couple more slides before, before I conclude. And, and I think this slide it, I found to be very important in terms of the implications of this process moving forward, in terms of the, what the built infrastructure is going to produce socially. Now, again, this is the, the Kailicha Business Center in Lita Park. And this is Lingileti West Shopping, Shopping Center right here. Now, these dots represent ideal business locations for would-be business owners. So for those who would be able to start a new business, those who would be able to, to establish enterprise in this area, create income generating projects, where are they going to then locate themselves? And as you can see, the clustering effect that's occurring is going right towards where the infrastructure is being built, right towards where existing infrastructure has already been developed. Um, and if we think back to the slide with the equal distribution of commerce in Harare Park, 
um, the, the construction and development of particular infrastructural kind of projects, social development projects, is in some ways going to, to influence how future social development is going to occur, both socially and economically. And I think one final point that's important to keep in mind as part of this process is, is, a, is a quick citation from, from this community activist who said there's more jobs in those projects and if you try to understand which area people are working in, they are from. You will find they are from the same area where there is a shopping mall. There's a shopping center, there's a craft market. You won't find people that are from this area that are working there. So the implications of this are that unless you're from the area where these projects are occurring, it's going to be quite difficult for you to access all right, the benefits of these projects. Um, Now, there's a connection between these projects, informal settlements, and HIV that I'd like to quickly outline for you before, before I conclude. Um, just to return back to some of the initial slides on informal settlements, all right, th what d determines what an informal settlement is is quite a gray set of criteria. Having a backyard shack is an informal settlement. So the idea that what you have, need to have is a vast slum, like Matare in Nairobi, to categorize as an informal settlement is not exactly accurate. All right? Backyard shacks proliferate in areas where people have difficulty making ends meet. All right? Movement occurs when people have difficulty economically. All right? And if this type of process is to continue, it's going, this, these areas are historically underserviced. All right? I think the unemployment rates and the income levels should clearly illustrate that point. All right? Now, if uneven development is to take hold in historically underserviced areas, there's a possibility, and again, this process is just beginning, so it's difficult to prognosticate what will occur, that th this will spark further movement. All right? People will have to be forced to move into other areas or to take on backyard shacks or to have densification of, of, of urban areas in order to have ends meet. And I think the, the issue we need to ask ourselves is, okay, it's unclear what the criteria are for what the direct correlation between HIV, AIDS, and informal settlements are. It's a chicken and egg argument. Does moving to an informal settlement cause you to, to acquire HIV, AIDS? Or does HIV, AIDS cause you to move into an informal settlement? The correlation is unclear. Right? However, increasing densification, in lower incomes in informal settlements are a very close proxy for higher rates of HIV, AIDS prevalence. So, if this is a serious commitment for the international community to stop the spread of HIV AIDS. One of the issues that needs to be kept in mind is balanced and even social development. You being able to free up participation in local structures, right? So, I mean, this is really the dilemma that, that, I, that I'm trying to present today, is how do you take these, lo these, these local political level levels and make them work and have feedback mechanisms for the international community? Is it possible to reinvigorate local democratic processes by giving the community a stake in determining how the response to HIV AIDS is carried out in their area? What intervention would get us to the point where the different civics movements would work together with donors and the state to coordinate and implement the new national multi-sexual AIDS plan? So rather than simply offer up questions, I thought it'd be important to give some suggestions that came about from the community through my interviews. And the first of these was to capacitate the existing institutional framework by expanding the role of the community and the MSAT, which is the local coordinating committee, and create a local AIDS council that serves the interests of civil society, community-based organization, and international donors. Now, the, the, the positives in this case are that this is the demand that's coming from the community. There were multiple times when people would ask me if there's any way that this would be possible. Currently, the MSAT is not allowed, or it's not within their mandate, I should say, um, to give critical feedback to the existing political structures. So while they can coordinate, they can't offer any critique of the government strategy right now. All right. The other part of this is what effect would creating more local autonomy for political processes have for the local level politics? If we're to follow Heller's argument that the loss of local political autonomy has pushed the civics movement into local structures to try and defend the interests of the community, all right, what, what effect would actually enabling the community to have a say in its own political future do for cooperation between the civics, to give power back to the community and to take it away from more financial 
monitoring and evaluation criteria in determining how policy outcomes should be measured. Uh, I think the drawback on this approach would be that how do you maintain institutional autonomy? Will these same political dynamics that I've just described take over? It's unclear. The second point is, our second option is to create an autonomous feedback, me feedback mechanism involving civil society organizations so the impact of these political processes in an objective needs assessment can be incorporated into the planning process for donors. Um, I think that really something that all donors should really strive for is getting detailed localized data um, to be able to create interventions um, that actually work. I think that if one ignores the political dynamics that are really strong, very strong in South Africa, then one is destined to fail in terms of how these interventions will be structured. Um, and I think and getting data is an important part of that process. I think the potential negative, imp negative impact of, of adopting this approach would that be how do you choose a civil society organization or how do you choose partners if you don't work through a local community mechanism? You know, that could just add to the existing political dynamic. And I think the final point, um, building off the mapping exercise, is that I think there is a place for spatial data to bring together different sectors, different silos of the donor community together to actually work within the same template. Um, and I know that there's a lot, of, a lot of discussion around the different types of mechanisms that are used for monitoring and evaluation and feedback. Um, but if we're able to pull together a, a, a data set that shows actually what's happening in terms of the, so the spatial development of a community, then this unevenness all right, that seems to be occurring, at least in one area, can be monitored, can be counteracted, and can be counterbalanced. And I want to emphasize that there, it's not that there's enough pie to go around and it's being given all to one part of the community. There are inadequate resources really to drive um, the agenda of addressing the historical inequalities that were created by apartheid. All right, so this is an area of great need in terms of social development, infrastructure, jobs. Um, how do we actually go about measuring which interventions are useful, which are successful? Um, what, what actual political data do we need and how do we go about getting that? The Government Accountability Office and the Center for Global Development have both argued that an approach that is more closely tailored to the needs of each country will achieve better outcomes for PEPFAR. Although challenges continue to exist at the national level, and provincial level with policy coordination in South Africa. It is not the responsibility of these levels of government to coordinate organizations or to implement policy. It is the mandate of local government. The focus for outcomes-based interventions must be at the level of implementation. As such, I am arguing that it is to this level that we must turn our attention in order for better coordination and therefore better outcomes to occur. And just to conclude, I just would like to give the last word to some of the community members that I work with who said in South Africa, it is easy for us to challenge the government, to criticize the government, to do many things without fearing that the government is going to intimidate, it, intimidate us, arrest us, you know? There is a change compared to before 1994, but the change, it is supposed to be, to be felt by people on the ground. Economically speaking, it is not being felt by people on the ground. What is the point of becoming free or being free when you're homeless, when you're jobless, when you're dying from AIDS? Thank you. Thank you very much, Ted. Uh, fascinating uh, presentation, uh, pointing out the scope and complexity of this issue in South Africa. Uh, I know you've tried very, very hard <laughs> to keep it short with a lot of information flow there, uh, so we can leave some time for questions, as is our, uh, our habit here. Uh, so let me invite questions from the audience. Uh, make your questions short. I think we'll do what we normally do, try to take two or three questions uh, at a time, uh, and, and then let uh, Ted respond to them as a group. Have any takers? Uh, okay, um, back there. Uh, my name is Veronica. I'm from Cameroon. Mm -hmm. And uh, Cameroon is a country where uh, appetite does not only exist in South Africa. It exists. It exists with us too because you are uh, discriminated because of your color, the language, the, the the dialect you speak, where you come from, the type of work you do. Uh, on that expose. Uh, well presented. I didn't find the role of women in South Africa. I don't know if women don't play a role in the, this AIDS fight. Mm -hmm. um, 
mothers have refused to talk about AIDS, and it looks like the problem of AIDS is left to teachers and the community. What would we say women should do in this fight against AIDS, knowing that the social structures don't synchronize action? What shall women do? Thank you very much. Do we have another? Okay, on the side, and do identify yourself and wait for the microphone because this is being filmed, so. <laughs> we want to get the audio as well as your pretty face. <laughs> Thank, you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Carol Boudreau from the Mercatus Center at George Mason University and um, have done some work in Kailicha and Longa Township as well. And I'm, a, I'm a, trying to piece together what I think is um, the, one of the central concerns, which is the concern about uneven social distribution of community development efforts. Um, and looking at your spatial presentation, which was very useful, we see that that une uneven social development seems to be correlated with political affiliations. So people who are pro-ANC are getting a set of um, community development projects that the people who are ID supporters are not getting. But when you looked at the map of just informal businesses, um, business that wasn't related to political efforts, that was really quite evenly distributed, it looked like. Um, but the point that you finally get to in terms of what's the policy recommendation seems to be additional decentralization. Um, my my um, sense is that the ANC is not especially pro-decentralization uh, and that there is significant problems if we just look at your mapping from decentralization efforts that do take place. So how, how are you thinking about um, squaring what looks to me to be a rather difficult problem. Thank you. While other people are thinking of questions, I think those are two pretty broad ones that give you enough meat to start with. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll start first with the the uh, the question on on gender, and I I, I appreciate your your critique. Um, the, the gender analysis is is not very much included in the limited time that I had to to focus on and present today. Um, however, I think it's important to note that women constitute 61% of all infections in South Africa and therefore are primarily affected by this epidemic. And I think both infected and affected because women are the primary caregivers and continue to support households in the context of the pandemic. Um, and I, I think that that should come out a bit in terms of the, the shift in focus from just men being migrants to looking at women in their movement. But in terms of, of the best way to move forward, um, I know that currently women are doing the, most of the organizing in communities around HIV AIDS advocacy. In terms of the treatment action campaign, the leadership historically has been primarily male and uh, white colored South Africans. Um, however, that's shifting. The chairperson of the TAC is now a woman and so is the general secretary. Um, but women on the ground are organizing. Women on the ground are starting community-based organizations. They are starting civil society organizations, church groups, leading advocacy efforts. So rather than say, what should women do? I think the question is more, what are women doing already that doesn't come through in this presentation? Um, and again, I think part of the, one of the curses about having a limited amount of time is that you have to make choices about what's presented and what's not. Um, but my experience in, in Karlicha as well as in Nyanga, Guguletu, was that women are spearheading this effort um, and that women are the ones who are accessing HIV AIDS services much more so than men. Um, I think that a part of that is that the public health sector or the public health system is primarily geared towards maternal health at the moment. Um, so all of the, the prevalence studies are being done on, on antenatal surveys. Um, and you know, I think that that has the impact of, of, of pulling more women into the struggle. But I think that you know, women's primary or role historically as carers and as really kind of a, a stalwart in communities and for families really does play through on the struggle for H HIV and AIDS. So rather than dictate what women should do um, in terms of, their st of this struggle against HIV and AIDS, I think that they're already doing the work. I think the question is that I'm trying to answer is how do we take the work that's already being done and amplify it by being able to figure out what's going on where. Um, and and I, I, I think that's the challenge that, that we can begin to work on is to say, look, um, this woman is doing advocacy work in this area. This woman is doing advocacy work in that area. Okay, well, how can we support their efforts through this mechanism? Um, 
and and I think that you know there is a lot of possibility for creating better outcomes that way. And I think that dictating what people should be doing on the ground is exactly what needs to be done less. I think that communities know where crime occurs. Community know, communities know where families are struggling. And it is essentially using kind of data-driven models that's dictating how services and goods are allocated and treatment is allocated. And I think that if we're really going to be able to utilize the structures that exist, and I think the, the challenge of Sanko, this civic structure, is that they go down to the level of street committee and they have organizational mechanisms that could be very well utilized for getting communities to work together to actually coordinate with local government. Um, and, I, and I think, how, how do we end the political divisiveness, or how can we bring people to the same table? I don't think it's gonna be ended anytime soon, right? And I think that the question is, is can you leverage people using donor-driven policies to actually work together? They don't have to love each other, and they're not going to, and they won't, that won't occur in the near future at all. But if, if women's efforts are to be honored and, and, and to be useful, and, and it's part of a national policy framework, we need to know what's going on. Um, and I think that feeds back into this concern about decentralization. And as you might imagine, this is a, uh, a uh, concern that, that I thought about right up to the moment that I presented this um, in terms of, of the implications of this presentation. Um, you know, one of the interesting things that came out of the Polokwane conference where um, Jacob Zuma became the president of the ANC and Thabo Mbeki was defeated was that the idea of reinvigorating the street committees was given a lot of, a lot of play. Um, and uh, Steve and I just talked about the fact that Zuma was recently in uh, Durban this week um, actually establishing street committees and perhaps this is just a ploy before general elections this year. Um, but I, I think that the decentralization process has arguably ended up creating greater centralization. And I think that that's one of the critiques that of the broader political system that comes out of the um, critique of service delivery models and the privatization of them. If you close down local levels of community input, policy is centralized inevitably in some ways. So I, I agree that there is that dynamic at play here that needs to be carefully monitored. Um, the question is, is more one of political buy-in and of getting the organizations to work in coordination um, because if the other option is that donors are going to be determining what the initiatives are going to be based upon their criteria and models are going to be developed based upon existing resources and prevalence rates and disease burden within a given district or different su a different sub-district. Now, how is that going to interplay with existing political processes on the ground? I, I'm not sure exactly how the two will, will coexist. What I do know is that this is what people were asking for from the community itself um, because I think their point of view, and I think that, that there's some legitimacy to it, is that they do know what's best for their sons, daughters, and families, um, and for the communities. And the current state of, of, of policy in South Africa is one that does not allow for local level communities to have a say in how their futures are being uh, developed. And I think that is such a stark contrast to the anti-apartheid movement of the 1980s when it was communities organizing themselves, deciding that they weren't going to pay their rent, that they were going to conduct work stayaways or they weren't going to purchase goods from the formal economy. Um, so I think that there's, there's this disjuncture in, in some ways that you're pointing out that, that is qu quite important. Um, however, I, I, again, I mean, to go back to my answer for the gender, the gender question, I, I really hesitate to offer up um, an all-encompassing solution to the issue, but I think I would rather say that it's going to actually vary from one area to another, and that I think that the unintended consequence of an initiative is always impossible to foresee before you actually go and do a pilot on it. Um, however, what I, what I would really argue is that um, the continued uh, kind of dislocation of local communities from the policy framework is I think the key level at which uh, coordination needs to occur and, and some level of cooperation um, if these great national AIDS policies that they have, these great strategic frameworks they have in place to tackle the epidemic are actually going to move forward. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. but Yeah, to, just to reinforce, uh, if I can uh, jump into this, Ted alluded to, but, uh, but at the national level the uh, 
the decentralization question has, has, has gone this way. Uh, in terms of uh, the Mandela era, uh, 1994 uh, era uh, ANC policy, it was all driven purportedly and for the most part really from the grassroots up. Uh, the kinds of uh, consultation that was taking place, uh, feeding into the leadership. Uh, Tabo Mbeki has, uh, has, has centralized considerably power. Uh, Zuma's, what he's going to do if he becomes president is, is, is not yet known, but Zuma's shtick has been decentralization, and he's been promoting that, uh, obviously partly for his own political advantage, because uh, that rings well down in the constituency level where, where he will be voted for. Uh, but uh, there's, a, there's a great dissatisfaction with ANC right now across the board. I was hearing everywhere I went meeting with ANC members and, and, and general public that, uh, uh, that there's going to be a horrible turnout for this coming election in 2009, April of 2009, because uh, no one will dare not vote for the ANC. There's no one else they really want to vote for outside of Western Cape and maybe in Hautang where the Democratic Alliance might pick up some significant votes. But uh, they, they are really, really angry at the ANC. Uh, so they're going to just stay away from the polls. Kind of interesting. But having said that, uh, what, what's more important to the kind of issues that Ted is looking at uh, is, is from the provincial level on down, quite honestly, because, because the, the seat of provincial power has been, been a real political football out there, and, and these, uh, uh, these governors uh, 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 that have been put in place uh, and, and the kind of uh, 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 tension we saw around the, the recent dismissal of, uh, of the, uh, uh, the one in uh, Western Cape uh, shows that that's where the power is playing out. And therefore, it depends upon their, rela their, their sense of, of the, the problem, their relationship with the grassroots level uh, at the provincial level uh, on down that I think uh, the most important uh, scenarios will play out, at least into the near future. Okay, other questions? Got one here. Um, Johan van der Waal, also from the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Um, I'm a South African, born and raised, and just completed my education in the United States. But um, thank you for your presentation. I think you hit on a lot of things that people often overlook. Um, I think you correctly also stated that one of the important things in order for these processes at the local level to be successful is buy-in. Buy-in not just from civil society, but specifically from people who are infected by this ep epidemic. Now, given that there's a big sense of suspicion in South Africa um, regarding the entire political process, as it's often let people at the local level be left at the short end during apartheid politically and now economically since 1994, what do you think should be done to really mobilize this buy-in? And then once that is done, what can be done to sustain that? to order to make these processes something that will yield the necessary long-term results um, for South Africa and for the people to where this can possibly remove these things across an um, entire generation of people. Next. Somewhat related, uh, Albert Cantrell. If you were to have done an opinion survey in the informal settlements as opposed to the other parts of urban South Africa. What do you think you would have picked up with respect to the social dynamics that would bear on the buy-in issue? Ted, let me add a question, and it's really just a clarification, and that is when you were talking about the, uh, uh, the divisions at, uh, at the local level, at the township level, uh, in Harare specifically, uh, and and the uh, the political patterns of uh, of development, uh, w does that com apply also to uh, antiretroviral delivery? That that you see any differences in actual uh, treating of HIV/AIDS? Okay, I'll I'll actually start with your question, Steve. I can answer that one most quickly. Um, just thinking back to the map that was presented, um, maybe I, I can even click back to it if that if you guys don't mind. Um, Right, this map right here. So this triangle right up here, or I'm sorry, the, the cross right up here at the top of this little peak, that, that would be an ARV distribution point for this area. So in, in some ways it's, it's closer in terms of proximity, but I, I think that for the most part, the issue is not constituency location for the clinics as much as it is oversubscription to antiretroviral therapy. Now, 
the infrastructure for delivering ARVs or antiretroviral drugs in, in Kailiche was primarily developed by Médecins Frontières, MSF Doctors of the Borders. So this was done essentially through like an NGO government partnership where, where MSF set out to actually argue through piloting that you can deliver ARVs, AIDS treatment, in a low resource setting, right? That you don't need 10 doctors to monitor someone's condition, that you can actually do this with nurses, using lay people. They also did this in Lusiki Siki in Eastern Cape. All right, so the, the issue right now is, is not the relationship between the constituency areas and the um, clinics as much. I mean, it, although it, it is obviously in, in that area, uh, the issue is is that creating enough clinics to carry the number of patients that need treatment. Um, and again, this kind of feeds back into an argument that I did not have time to cover today that I clipped out, which is the issue of health infrastructure in the post-apartheid period um, and the pace at which it's being developed. Um, and, I, and I think that that's more of an argument about macroeconomic policy um, that I wanted to kind of focus on, the political process today. Um, but there are many debates about the choices that the ANC has made in terms of its its economic platform, um, switching from a 1994, the Reconstruction Development Program, which argued through um, growth through, through redistribution, so, and then switching to the, the growth, employment, and redistribution macroeconomic strategy in 1996, which argued that we should redistribute by continuing to grow the economy. And what that's meant is that more of a fiscally austere economic framework, less infrastructural development. So these issues are moving slowly. Um, especially in terms of service points. The Western Cape is actually quite progressive on a lot of these issues. And I mean, I've, I spoke to members of the, the HIV AIDS directorate about this, and th they're trying to develop men's clinics in, in Kailicha uh, to point to the gender question because men often don't want to go and speak to their, you know, their sister's cousin about the STD that they have or the fact that they might be HIV positive. Um, they often go outside of their area to access services for testing, et cetera. So they're piloting that. They're piloting less centralized forms of ARV distribution. But the, these service points are oversubscribed. I mean, to go back to that slide where they talked about going to that line at 4 a.m., the reason why they wait months is because they can't take any more patients given the existing infrastructure. So um, I think that's more, more the challenge. And, and I, I, wouldn't, I think the other issue is that they dismissed the Deputy Minister of Health in 2007, in, in August, for declaring a public health emergency over infant deaths at Fur Hospital in the Eastern Cape. Now, President Tabwambeki said he wouldn't step in an interministerial conflict, but he was deeply implicated in that dismissal. Um, the, there is a, a public health crisis in South Africa, and it's not just because of HIV and AIDS. There is inadequate funding allocations right now to meet need. There's not been a needs assessment done in any of the health districts that I analyzed, the sub-districts in, in Cape Town. So they don't actually no burden of disease outside of primarily antenatal surveys. So what's going on with the men? It's unclear, actually, right? It's all extrapolated from existing data. Um, so uh, the, the opinion survey, um, this, is, this is a difficult question to, uh, to postulate on, just in terms uh, of, of the, the dynamics of the buy-in issue, because um, there are especially in the Johannesburg area, the National Civic, South African National Civic Organization is doing a significant amount of organization in, in informal settlements. Um, and I think one of the issues in, in terms of accessing these types of, of, of surveys that's continually a challenge in South Africa is that, I mean, when you go in, who do you represent and who wants to speak with you? I, I think that these areas are in many ways um, kind of illegal dwellings, right? They're, they're not really on formalized land uh, rights uh, or plots. Um, people tend to be very suspicious of people who come in asking questions. Um, and, and I would say that it takes quite a long time to get someone to speak with you. It took over eight months for me to be f kind of friends with the person that kind of helped I initiate this mapping exercise before that they would even talk to me about um, any of these issues. And it took a lot of prodding. I mean, it. I really had to push to say, but but what exactly do you mean, no development in my area? What does that mean? And you know, just a shrug of the shoulders and just frustrated and walking away. But eventually, I was able to work through. So I think that the first issue would be um, that there's a lack of community cohesion in these areas um, because of the issue of movement, right? 
And I think that, that that's one of the, the issues around informal settlements that's important to, to keep in mind is that there is fluidity. These aren't stable settlement areas for the most part. Um, but, but what I would say is that based upon the research that I did would be that there would be some of this, the lingering effects of this HIV AIDS dissidence that would take place that is kind of intertwined with an African nationalist and an anti-Western sentiment that views pharmaceutical companies as exploiting the health of poor South Africans for profit, that, that views the quote-unquote African renaissance that Tabo Mbeki has made his project in danger um, due to profiteering by kind of global kind of multinationals. Um, so there's, there's a skepticism towards um, HIV and AIDS, all right? And it's also a taboo subject, let's be honest. South Africa is it's a very religious, religious country, and, and talking about HIV AIDS means you're talking about sex with someone that you don't even know indirectly. And so I, I think that it's quite difficult to go and talk about HIV AIDS sometimes with a woman if you're a man, if you don't know them. I mean, you're really bringing a topic to the forefront that is quite taboo, all right, that doesn't, isn't really talked about. Um, so I think, I think that those are some of the dynamics that would, I think, really question the, the usefulness of the survey method. You know, and I think that the more of a long-term, um, op open-ended method might yield better results, especially if you're sending someone in to talk with you about these issues. Um, and the local political process. Um, I mean, I, I think that there's a couple of issues that, that I mean, I appreciate your question. Uh, there's a couple of issues that I think need to be revisited and I think that the, the biggest issue that, you know, to go back to Patrick Heller's work, is, is what's the connection between the privatization of service delivery mechanisms and the effect that they're having in the local political process in terms of being able to kind of make services and initiatives fit in the local community. I mean, on, on one level, it's really not the, the purview of the international community to decide local level politics and the, the institutions that are being used. I mean, however, the Global Fund is already doing that in some ways by funding this local AIDS council form, quasi-local AIDS council in terms of the MSAT, um, and trying to develop a monitoring form to, to see what's going on. But I think that the, the privatization of water, the privatization of electricity is, is a much maligned um, developmental strategy in South Africa. Um, and I think that um, the issue of cross-subsidization for the delivery of, of basic social services is a model that's historically been used, um, taxing rich communities at a higher rate in order to provide infrastructure to poor communities. And in South Africa, this has the, kind of a, a, a dual purpose, I think. The wealthier areas, for a large part, are white in South Africa, right? So these are the communities that would have benefited from the unequal distribution and uh, resources under apartheid. And the poor areas are predominantly black or non-white, like colored, in, in Cape Town specifically, um, who would then be benefiting from cross subsidization as a method for distributing resources. So I think that if you continue with cost recovery, which essentially shifts the cost of infrastructural development back onto the community through like higher per unit prices. So if it's for water, right, you bring in a, a private contractor because local government does not necessarily have the capacity to manage a, you know, its, its systems. What they say is, okay, we need to build X meters of pipe. We need to build this amount of infrastructure. It's going to cost Y amount. We are then going to cost charge a per unit price of water at this level to recoup the cost of developing the infrastructure in this community. So it essentially compartmentalizes the, the infrastructural cost onto the community that historically has not had infrastructure for primarily political reasons. And I think that that in and of itself is a huge debate in South Africa, and I think that when you go on the ground and see the human costs, I mean, I mean, cholera and dysentery are really avoidable public health issues. Um, and, and I think when you go to um, Tembors Cliff in Cape Town, I mean, you're not going to have anyone suffering from a case of dysentery. So I, I, I think that those are, are broader debates that aren't always brought into the HIV AIDS arena. They're touched on in public health. Um, but I think that the way that we can bring these issues together is through the political realm. And now, if they were to actually change the mandate of local government out of the managerial model to a more kind of participatory model, you know, I, I think to go back to Steve's point, you'd really have to challenge the dominant political dynamics that are running through the ANC, which is, I mean, very much a party that gets local buy-in from its councillors, 
All right, you do not have people who don't toe the line who maintain their political position in the ANC. Um, and I think Ibrahim Razul, the, the Western Cape Premier, is a good example of that. Um, now, will the change in leadership allow for greater local uh, variation in terms of policy positions for the distribution of resources? I certainly hope so. Um, however, these issues about cost recovery are primarily tied back to budgetary concerns and local capacity concerns. And I think that those are long-term challenges, which is, you know, to go back to my introduction, if PEPFAR, uh, primarily HIV AIDS platform, is intending to grow local capacity, all right, how can we actually do that? What's the mechanism that, that we can use that? And I think that the first, one of the first ways that we can do that is by actually reinvigorating the democratic structures at the local level, giving them a, a stake in determining their own political futures. Um, and I think that you know, that's one of the ways to go about doing that. But in terms of, of a solution, you know, there's a lot of structural issues and moving parts that would have to shift in order for local levels to be, uh, to have that type of autonomy to be able to do that, I think. So I think that's actually where, unfortunately, where, where, where space has to be made in order for local level differentiation to occur. Okay, I think we're bouncing against our time ceiling, but uh, let's uh, end on one last question or two, if anybody's got a pressing concern. Here we go. <laughs> well, you'll get the last word. Um, I'm Lauren Herzer. I work here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Um, my question is about the, the immigrant population, and if you saw a correlation between how um, the presence of immigrants in a community might have an impact on the provision of services by the government. Is that clear? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I just to, I guess, provide a bit of a historical answer to that. The, the, the lines of, of nationality in South Africa, I think, are, are quite blurry until quite recently, which all of a sudden they, they hardened in the context of the xenophobic, xenophobic attacks. Um, however, when you look back at the, the history of the mining industry, you know, there have been Mozambicans living in South Africa for the past 25 years. Uh, the line between Lesotho in South Africa, Swaziland in South Africa, is quite gray. Uh, I mean, some of my good friends in South Africa were Zimbabwean, and they, you know, they worked for Standard Bank, which is, you know, one of the largest banks in, in, in the African continent. So I, I, think that, I think the first point is that I think until quite recently, I think that nationality was not the most important point for demarcation in terms of, of, of residence and in terms of service delivery. Um, however, I think that one of the challenges that's really come up recently is that, you know, what are the real long-term implications, long-term consequences of the anti-apartheid struggle? School stayaways, um, kind of children leading, kind of, you know, look back to Soweto, 76, you know, this is children who are leading the struggle, right? I will, you know, I'll go to school when we're free. And I think that a lot of migrants come in with additional skills, especially for Zimbabweans, um, that South Africans were not able to get, or not able to acquire um, as, as part of their youth. And as part of, that's the, one of the, the long-term repercussions of, of the anti-apartheid struggle. Um, in terms of a correlation between services and uh, nationality or immigrants, immigrant status, it depends on the kind of skill set of, of the migrant. I mean, to take the example of some of my friends, if you're a chemical engineer or a financial economist, you'll be able to live wherever you want, pretty much, in South Africa. However, if you have no skills, you're going to end up in the squatter camps. You're going to end up in areas that aren't serviced or that are site and service models, where they will install a tap and they might have a couple of, uh, you know, latrines, pit latrines, or latrines that they empty a couple of times a month. Um, now, that that's more of an issue of an informal settlement. And I think in the past seven to ten years, Zimbabweans have been streaming into South Africa due to the ongoing political and economic crisis in that country. Um, so is there a formal correlation between informal settlements and migrant status? Perhaps more so in the past ten years than there was historically. Um, <clears throat> does that correlate to services? Yes, but only because it's not formal formalized service areas, not really due primarily to immigrant status. Is that, is that it for time? Yeah. Unless there's one last Anyone real have a last question. question. Okay. Let's all thank Ted again for a very, very good <laughs>